Good, y'all sounded wonderful today. Amen. Amen. Everybody grab a Bible. Grab a Bible. Amen. Before we get started, let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Woe unto the wicked. Then it says, It shall be ill with him. Then it says, It shall be ill with him. Then it says, For the reward of his hand shall be given to him. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hand shall be given him. What that means is this. What comes around, goes around. What comes around, goes around. You have to be careful about the things that you do. You're young, and most of you are young in here. Because what you don't realize is, the very things that you do, the good things that you do, and the bad things that you do, they will all one day visit you again. If you're good to somebody, somebody will be good to you. But if you're mean to somebody, somebody will be mean to you. So you have to be careful about the things that you do. Because one day, you'll hear a knock on your door and will be that very thing that you did to someone else. Uh, blocking is an amazing thing. I guess it's a, a, a thing with social media you can block and with the cell phones. But if you block somebody that loves you, one day somebody will block you. And then you will take a turn and you will see what it feels like when your love is sent to voicemail, when your love is ignored. So the thing is, be careful about the things that you do. And, and believe me, I've had people vex me, irritate me. Uh, I have a, a young man right now. He sent me messages every day. You the sinner, you the bad pastor. He sent, he sent this to me every day. But I still refuse to block him. Because I still love that young man, although he's going through a storm. So the thing is, be careful about the things that you do. For one day, they will come back to visit you. Turn the book of Jeremiah 15 and 16. Thank you, Jesus. Jeremiah 15 and 16. Jeremiah 15 and 16. Jeremiah 15 and 16 says this. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. All right? And the word was unto me joy and rejoicing in my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Thy words I found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. What does this mean? Whatever you feed will grow. Whatever you feed will grow. So my question to you today is, what are you feeding? What are you feeding? Whatever you feed will grow. Uh, it, it's interesting, we have children in here today. We have a lot of little babies. And the thing is, you feed that baby. As a matter of fact, we've been watching Jai's baby since, it, since the baby was born. And I looked at the baby today, he's twice the size he was when I first saw him. Uh, this young baby right here is growing. Children grow because we feed them. But what are you feeding in your life? Are you feeding good things in your life? Are you feeding prosperity in your life? Are you feeding health in your life? Are you feeding your relationship? Are you feeding your mind? Are you feeding your studies? Are you feeding your dreams? 
Are you feeding fear? Are you feeling despair? Are you feeding negative things? See, the problem with a lot of us is, oftentimes we feed negative things. And if you feed negativity, that negativity will grow. You gotta learn how to stop feeding negative things. Because if you feed negative things, the negative things in your life will start to grow. See, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. If you feed faith, then God says he is pleased with you. You got to learn how to feed faith. Because if you feed fear, if you feed anything else, then you will have the very thing that you feed. Next, turn me to the book of Romans 10 and 17. Romans 10 and 17. Romans 10 and 17. Romans 10 and 17. Romans 10 and 17 says this. It says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God says, you increase your faith by what you hear. Uh, the interesting thing about this generation, uh, you have so much access to the internet. You have 24 hours of television, 24 hours of Instagram, 24 hours of Netflix, 24 hours of Hulu, 24 hours of, of free, and all kind of foolishness in these apps. You have 24 hours of constant information. But is that information increasing your faith? When you hear all this stuff on Netflix, uh, my son, they just binge watch show after show after show, and, uh, episode after episode, and you keep watching these things. I guess the new thing, uh, P-Valley now is hot. Uh, a lot of y'all watch P-Valley, I do too, but we watch P-Valley. What is that feeding you? Is it teaching you anything? Is it increasing your faith? Will you be better for it after it's over? And what happens is, Satan is so smart, Satan is so clever, that he feeds you a whole bunch of foolishness. So that when your test comes, you're not prepared. See, the devil knows that you're watching P. Valley. He knows that you're watching Netflix 10 hours a day. He knows that you're on Instagram 5 hours a day. He knows you're on TikTok 8 hours a day. He's feeding you all this foolishness so that when he comes for you, you have no word in you because faith comes by hearing and you keep hearing foolishness. So when the devil comes to test you, you don't have no word for him. And since you have no word for him, whatever he's bringing to the table, it might just happen. You have to learn to increase your faith. Increase your faith. Be careful of the things that you hear it. See, the thing about Roddy Rich, Roddy Rich is awesome. But is he going to teach you how to be rich? No. Uh, the thing is, you listen to all these, these people and all these different things, but they're not going to teach you anything. Increase your faith. Increase your hearing. Turn to Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6. Why do we need faith? Hebrews 11 and 6. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6 says this. But without faith... It is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you don't have faith, God ain't listening to you. You wonder why your dreams don't come true. No faith. You wonder why you don't have that house that you've been dreaming of. For no faith. That job, that man, that husband, whatever it is you've been asking for, you don't have enough faith. Because God says he rewards based on your faith. Your faith is powerful. But if you keep hearing foolishness, you won't have any faith. So be careful about the things that you listen to. Because you need to learn how to increase your faith. If you increase your faith, you have what God has called you to have. Uh, turn me to the book of John 15 and 5. John 15 and 5. John 15 and 5. Thank you, Jesus. John 15 and 5. Well, pastor, I hear you, man. You talk about this faith thing. But I know people who got money, they don't even believe in your Jesus. I know people who don't even go to church. And they got big cars, and they got big houses. As a matter of fact, they got big chains on. Why do I need this guy? I'm glad you said that. John 15 and 5. It says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. 
He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But then it says, for without me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if a, a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And the men gather and they cast him into the fire and they are burned. Now here's the thing. You don't need God. You don't. You can live your whole life without God. You can. Uh, I know few people that live without God and they, they have big houses and they have successes and they have all these things. But here's what happens when you live a life without God. If you keep reading this passage, it says, without me, you can do nothing. And then it says, your life will become withered. Your life will become burned. Your life will become as trash. You don't want to be withered by God. Withered means you're passing away. You don't want to have a life that is not fulfilled with prosperity and good things. Because if you don't have God in your life, you will have a life that is not sustained by anything. You will have a life that doesn't have what you want in it because that life is withered. You need to understand that a relationship with God will give you what you need to attain what you're asking God for. Because without God, yeah, you can have a whole man without God. You can have a whole car, a whole car, a whole job, a whole, whole 401k and all these different things. But without God, you will have nothing in the end. I did a funeral Friday. And I did a funeral at a mansion in Los Angeles. The house that I did the funeral at was worth $5 million. I ain't never been in a house that fancy in my life. And I'm standing there and I'm like, wow, God, look at where I'm at. And then God says, you're here for a funeral. And I had to remind the people in the funeral that when you die, your car don't go with you. When you die, your clothes don't go with you. When you die, your money, your, 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 your 10 million followers don't go with you. None of that stuff goes with you. Only thing that goes with you is what you did for God. The only thing that you take with you when you die, what did you do for God? And if you lived this whole life and it was all about you, and you bling bling and you had a whole bunch of things you will die not knowing God and you won't go into eternity seeing him with a smile on his face because you carry nothing with you when you leave here the only thing you carry with you is what did you do for God you're never more like God than when you love you're never more like God than when you give to somebody who doesn't have we have to learn how to live for God and not to live just for self Learn how to live for God. We're almost done. Turn me to Micah 6 and 12. Micah, M-I-C-A-H. We're almost done. We're almost done. Micah 6 and 12. Micah 6 and 12. Micah 6 and 12. We'll read verses 12 through 15. This is a good one. Micah 6 and 12. It said, For rich men thereof are full of violence. And the inhabitants of thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. It says, for rich men thereof are full of violence. So when I first read this, I was like, I don't see rich people running around beating up folks. I don't see rich people doing drive-by shoots in the neighborhood. And then God sent me an email this morning. It said, the rich men are full of violence. And when it says they're full of violence, they're not running around here shooting people. They have inner turmoil. They don't like themselves. They live a whole life full with unhappiness. They got the biggest cars, the biggest bank account, they live in the biggest houses, and they have no joy. They travel everywhere all over the world. They got houses all over the world, and they stand in man. Every day, rich people commit suicide. And you wonder, why would you commit suicide? with $27 million in the bank. How do I know this? I had a frat brother, a young frat brother. He went to USC. Short story. He did a TV show on Disney back in the day. He just got a brand new contract for $5 million. And we found out he blew his head off. And we couldn't understand it. You got $5 million. You got a very successful TV show. You're handsome. You're young. You got everything that you want. But the Bible says... If you live for money, you'll be incomplete. 
Because life is more than zeros behind your bank account. Life is more than a big old gold chain and driving a big old fancy car. One of the worst feelings that you'll ever have is you get the big Mercedes and you get the Louis Vuitton and the red bottoms and you don't like yourself. So many people are in that situation. It's interesting, the EDD came down and, and the money flowed from the government and you see people that ain't never had money get money. Were they nicer? No. Were they happier? No. Did the hood change? No. We had more drive-by shootings when they had all that money than we ever had. We had more killings in the neighborhood, more people breaking into people's houses. But the hood got money because money's not the key to your problem. Because if you have a life full of money and you have no God, you have no joy. Well, why do you say that? For the Bible says, for the joy of the Lord is my strength. Joy comes from God. It don't come from things. Stop letting the devil trick you. Uh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give all y'all $100,000. And you will find out this ain't nothing. Because all more money is, is just more problems. What do you mean? A bigger house. Bigger car, bigger things, more friends that really don't like you just trying to get with you to get what you got. You don't even know who your friend is when you have money. So the thing is, learn how to build and peace with God. Turn to Psalms, turn to Psalms 5 and 12. We almost done. Psalms 5 and 12. Psalms 5 and 12. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 5 and 12. Psalms 5 and 12. Psalms 5 and 12. All right, Psalms 5 and 12 says this. It says, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, would thou compass him as a shield. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, would thou compass him as a shield. The Bible says here, God will bless the righteous man. And what is a righteous man? It's a man that lives with good intention in his heart. See, the thing is, there is no such thing as a perfect man. Nobody can walk before God and say, God, I'm perfect and I'm righteous. Can't do that. But what God will use to determine your righteousness is your heart. That's why the heart is so important. The heart is a muscle, but it also has a muscle memory. It has a brain attached to your heart. The heart is attached to your head and it's attached to your stomach. That's why I remember Bishop, when they used to y'all just play football. Before the football game, he get nervous. I know some people before the football game, they would throw up before every football game. Because the heart is connected not only to your mind, but also to your stomach. The Bible says here, God will bless the righteous and he will give them favor that will compass them as a shield. What is favor? Favor is when you driving around with no driving license and the police pull you over and you don't go to jail. Favor. Favor is when you apply for a job and you ain't got a resume but you get to God. Favor. Favor is when you didn't pay your rent for six months and they don't put you out on the street. Favor. Favor is when they bless you in spite of what you're going through. That's called God's favor. There was a woman named Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa didn't have a cash app Mother Teresa didn't have a bank account. Mother Teresa didn't have a job. Mother Teresa didn't even have a house. But she traveled all over the world. And she always traveled first class. She went and ate at the finest restaurants and never had to pay a nickel because she had the favor of God on her life. If God covers you with favor, you don't need more money. You better start asking God for more favor. Stop asking God, God, give me money. God, give me money. No, -uh. say, God, can you bless me with favor? Because if God give you enough favor, you have all the money that you ever need. If God give you enough favor, you have whatever you require for him. Ask God for his favor. And then seek to be righteous before God. Seek to be righteous before man. Righteous means... I want for you what I want for myself. See, if you can get that in your spirit, then God will start to bless you. Uh, I, I want you to have what I have. Matter of fact, I want you to have more than what I have. That's a righteous man. 
I, I want your children to do better than my children. That's a righteous man. I, I want you to be more prosperous than me. That's a righteous man. If God can look in your heart and see that you care about your brothers and sisters the same way that you care for yourself, he will deem you righteous. Because I won't hurt you. Because I won't hurt me. The Bible says do it to others as you will have them do it to you. Don't hurt anybody if you don't want to be hurt. Learn to be righteous. And the very last thing, the very last thing. Turn to Mark 11 and 25. Mark 11 and 25. We done after this. Mark 11 and 25. Mark 11 and 25. Mark 11 and 25. It says, and when ye stand praying, forgive. If you have an issue against anybody, that your Father, which is also in heaven, may forgive you of your trespasses. Verse 26. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. This passage says this. When you stand up and pray, every morning you get out of your bed, you pray. Before you eat your dinner, you pray. Before you go to sleep, you pray. Before you start, God keep telling my children, God bless me. And if, before you start doing all that laundry list, God says, forgive somebody. See, if you pray without forgiving somebody, God don't even listen to your prayers. That's why so many of us don't get what we want from God. You, 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 you mad at this person and you holding it in your heart, you don't realize that God uses your heart for blessing. He looks in your heart. And if he sees that, oh, you mad at your cousin. I ain't blessing you. Oh, you still mad at your ex-boyfriend. You, you still mad at your mama. You still mad at your dad. You still mad. Why would God bless you and you got anger in your heart? You got to learn how to release that thing. You got to start forgiving people. You're never more like God than when you forgive. See, forgiveness is love. Forgiveness is love. We have to forgive because God forgives us. What would your life look like if God held you accountable for everything you did wrong? Think about this. Imagine if God said, oh, you had sex, you had sex, you tattooed, you smoked weed, you got drunk, you cut, you cut, you'd be dead right now. But every time you say, God, please forgive me, he looked at your heart, it's forgiven. Matter of fact, he said he cast your sins away as far as the east is from the west. He throw your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. God don't remember your sins, but Satan does. Let me say it again. God doesn't remember your sins, but Satan does. And what Satan will do is, he has a little book, I promise you. He got a little book. And he, every time you do something, he try to re bring your, your remembrance, what you've done wrong. Oh, remember how ratchet you were? Sometimes I be standing up here, and I think about things I used to do. I be like, oh my God. The thing is, that's the devil bringing those memories back to your mind. Some of y'all think about last night when you were turning up and fading it up. God, that's the devil bringing those memories back to you. Because once God forgives you, he don't bring it back up again. You have to learn how to be like God. Once you forgive, leave it alone. Stay away from it. Forget it. Forget about it. What? Well, what? Well, well, uh, they gonna hurt me again? The Bible says, if your brother offends you seventy times seven, forgive him each time. I ain't no fool. I ain't gonna forgive him. He hurt me. He cut me. He did this. Forgive him. Well, if I keep forgiving him, he gonna keep hurting me. Leave. You don't have to be around people who don't treat you right. You don't have to stay around people who do you wrong. You ain't got to be in their presence. Step out of their presence. Step out of their way. Vacate. You can still love them from a distance. In fact, there are a whole lot of people you got to love from far away. You, you pick up the phone, and as soon as they start getting on the nerves, all right, I got to go, girl. hang up on them and just go on about your business. Some people you can't be around them, especially people who have no peace. If a person is hurting, they're going to hurt you. Hurt people hurt other people. So if you got a loved one, a mama, uncle, cousin, sister, best friend, and he's hurt or she's hurt, and they hurt you, sometimes you got to leave them alone. Forgive them and then just say, all right, I, I thought you did. I'll see you at Christmas. You ain't got to be around them all the time. 
So we have to learn how to forgive. And if you do that, God will open up the windows of heaven. And everything that you ask, he will give to you. How do I know this? I'm going to shut up after this. This morning, I was talking, I was, normal, I was sitting there by, you know, come to church, and I sent it to one of my friends. I can't say her name, because she watch. I love you, girl. Uh, long story short, she's been single for 25 years. She's been single for 25 years. And, and she, when she got saved, she said, I ain't going to have no sex no more, which was hard, because she dropped dead gorgeous. So she said, I'm single and I'm not having sex because I'm going to try to do this church thing right. Short story. She's been wanting a man for 25 years. She's been standing on faith. God, I don't want a man. But, but every time I give her one, they want to have sex. And, you know, I might slip up every now and then, but God, I want to do this thing right. Here's the short version of the story. She says, Michael, I've been in a relationship with this man for a year. I said, oh, I said, oh, I just got started. Oh, yo, my God, I'm so happy for you. And she says, here's how I met him. His daughter lives across the street from me. I said, what? She knocked on my door one day. And she says, I have a whole father over here. And he's lonely. I think y'all should get together. That's how she met her boyfriend. And he came and they met and they've been together ever since. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Now here's what's powerful about that. She stood on faith. She, she, what, she, she did what she had to do. She kept God first. And she believed that God would provide her for whatever she wants. The Bible says God will give you your heart's desires. So if you put God first, everything that you can imagine will come true. Think about that. Put God first, and it says he will give you the desires of your heart. Some of you want vacation. It's coming. Some of you have a big house. It's coming. Some of you want a better job. It's coming. Some of you want college degrees. It's coming. Some of you want children. You want to be married. You want all these different things. Put God first, and his word says he will do it. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Everybody stand. into heaven. And the reason why we do that is because we know that this life is not complete. There is another life. But the Bible says God will not be mocked. God is looking at your heart. He's determining the faith that's in your heart. You need to increase your faith. Because if you have great faith, you can do great things. Um, I am not a great man at all. But I'm a fool for God. So here's the thing. If you are a fool for God, then God will do wonders for you. The Bible said God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because God likes people who are stupid like me. In fact, all the people he used in the Bible were losers. David, loser. Moses, murderer, loser. Isaac, Isaiah, all these men had great faults. Paul was a killer, a murderer, and a blasphemer. He was one of the worst sinners that ever was in the Bible. And he wrote 70% of what's called the New Testament. Because God used failed men. And he says, he shows them, if you take a failure, I can make him into a success. So you want to be God's success story. And that starts by you saying, God, you know I like weed. I like sex. I love tattoos. God, I like to get faded. 
God like I do. And you just be real with God. The Bible says, they that worship him in spirit and in truth will know God. You have to worship God where you at. That's why we started a church full of young people. My sons was out last night before 5 o'clock in the morning. I don't know what they were doing. That's their business. They ain't got nothing to do with that. But they here today. Because they know, regardless of what I do, I'm going to put God first. So learn how to keep putting God first. And the young things, you will outgrow them. And you will get better. And you will get stronger. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Anybody have any words? Let's go. Anybody have any words? I just remember being in my 20s, that I had an the world, doing stupid stuff, and now that I'm about to be 32, it's like, thank God for what you believe, and care for me, and love me, and I appreciate him for that. That's beautiful. I ain't never been here, I ain't been in church since I was like seven, eight, something like that. But I was going like great design or something like that. But I walked in, her mom had these thoughts on the church, and I was like, I get to go? She was like, yeah. And she was like, you scared? I was like, yeah, I'm scared. She was like, I'm scared. But like, walked in, I felt weird. But then, like, I like you, you cool. I like you. Oh, God. I don't even know Amen. Give my hand, clap. Hallelujah. Bless you, Kareem. Amen. Oh, great baby. Jesus, amen. That's her thing. Amen. And, and when you go to college and graduate from UCLA, you gonna still say that. Amen. We gonna hold you accountable. All right, everybody, grab a hand. Grab a hand. Grab a hand. Right here, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for this bounty of youth. Father, I ask that you continue to bless them and to strengthen them, Father, help them to achieve their dreams. Father, some of our hearts are broken, Father. We've had disappointments. Some of us are angry at you because of things that we went through. Father, we ask that you heal our hearts. Heal us from our brokenness, Father. Help us, Father, and guide us to where you called us to be. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into that hand. I squeeze prosperity into that hand. I squeeze vision and purpose into that hand. So that these young people will come to hand and not to tail. So they become victorious and never defeated. So that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hug somebody. Amen. God bless you guys. Oh.